Hi, Erica. Hi, everyone. I'm Glenn Lowry from OCADU. Welcome to our virtual studio visit with Erica Tan. This is part of a collaboration between OCADU and the University of Art London. Erica, I wondered if you'd just start by um, introducing yourself and saying a little bit about your practice. Hi, everyone. Welcome to my studio. Um, I'm based in London. I'm part of Central St. Martin's University of the Arts. I make work that I call moving image um, with a sort of expanded social dimension. Um, and currently I'm working on my mother's archives. Um, welcome to my studio. It is a virtual studio and um, I thought I'd share today some of the kind of places I've been working in um, as my backdrop. And you can see I can sort of disappear slightly. Um, and it comes from a recent piece of work where during the lockdown in London where um, I was invited by another artist to collaborate with them on a performance and had been sitting through so many of these Zoom meetings, uh, looking at people's backgrounds and their houses and sort of perving into their spaces um, and also all the desires that people were showing by, you know, having these lovely um, seascapes and um, coconut trees in the background. So I started thinking about the backgrounds of um, these screens that we're looking at. Um, and did a piece of work, a sort of performance where I was um, using the background of the space that the other collaborator was in. So I sort of had him pre video something so that I could enter into his space, even though I was virtually quite distant from him. I love that. That's and beautiful. So that's um, so I'm not going to show you my real studio because really I'm in my bedroom in London. Um, my son's down the corridor doing his school and my partner's teaching in another room and um, this place is a state and um, that's probably what a lot of people are in this situation of at the moment so um, I prefer to sort of perhaps show you where I was um, a few months back if I think about um, six months ago I was um, doing a residency at um, Stanley Picker Gallery in southwest London and it came with a residency space too and was gearing up to um, making some work with them and to have a show that should have taken place in April and now is supposed to take place in November but you can see it's an amazing space um, and I'd been working in there um, doing various things like filming so there's a bit of me filming something in this space um, and in the space next door there was uh, my studio so this is my studio full of i should say not my own artwork um, but in actual fact my mother's so i've been working recently on um, a project called barang barang which in malay means stuff and things and um, in a way it comes as a crisis both as an artist but somebody living in london but also this question of what we do with histories and historical objects um, when they can't be, when there's no relevance to them, where um, they aren't acknowledged as relevant. Um, so I've been working for quite a while and sort of ideas of potentially unrecognized histories or um, forgotten lost histories. So my mother's artwork is a real burden to me because I don't have enough space in my life to even look after my own. And she was a, um, Un, she was a sort of self-taught artist and left from Britain and went to Singapore uh, where she married my father and she became an artist there. Um, and as a sort of British person going to Singapore, she's she's never been sort of acknowledged there. Um, anyway, I have this material and something occurred with her material and my residency I was on where um, suddenly I was kind of looking at a various female artists actually who had either not been recognized or potentially at some point in their career had had some recognition but had been forgotten um, or had posthumously become recognized. So um, I'd been developing a piece of work where I was speculatively bringing together these different figures, historical figures who never met in real time but in filmic time could meet. So that brings me on in a way that I'm working a lot with moving image. Um, I don't call myself a filmmaker. I'm working, I suppose, between moving image objects, histories, archives, museums, um, sometimes kind of working with performance, sometimes making objects. Um, and this piece of work started 
to the residency in the space um, and the long term opportunity to work in a different way to actually have a studio space started me going down so many routes that this piece of work not only became about my mother's stuff, but my stuff, um, the stuff of other artists, and then the materiality of making. Um, and so it started to become quite a big project. And the eventual idea was to work in this lovely gallery space, I'll show you an image there, um, including some of my mum's objects, um, as well as her paintings, as well as using the space, the theatrical lights in the space, um, and to do video projection work and to have something that was going to actually be a kind of choreography of different media within the space. And of course, now thinking about that, it was ambitious and I wanted to be ambitious, um, but I found myself completely undermined by the current situation where I can't sort of, I can't get my head around the idea of justifying perhaps the time, the space, the money to create work in this way um, when we could have another lockdown any moment. Um, also, the yeah. last six months, I've been locked out of this space, um, so I haven't had anything, um, all the material um, that I've been working with, all my mother's stuff is locked in the studio there and I haven't had access. So I've had to kind of, um, you know, come back to base in a way, which is often my, my room at home, um, the studio is, my studio has always been peripatetic. I'm always looking for another site to work in. The work and the production of work comes from sort of social situations and um, specific kinds of sites. So the studio as, um, as an idea has not really, or a, as a support structure hasn't been so important to me. Um, so this recent project was a sort of a real, chance to actually become much more studio based um, and I was just getting my teeth into it and I was buying things like rubber and um, coconut fiber and um, ceramics and things like this and, and now it's all sort of sitting there probably going moldy oh. um, so yes yeah no I'm so I'm sorry to hear that but I love there's a, a kind of flip that I, I see happening here and 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 that is that the the actual spaces that uh, are connected to art production as we move into the future have become kind of virtual. I was saying I haven't been into the university um, since March. Well, I went in one day to grab some gear and uh, whatever I could in my office in 20 minutes and get out. And so the actual spaces that define our um, our interactions, our work, have become this kind of virtual possibility. Will it be open in November? Will it be open in January? And I, I really appreciate the way that uh, you're playing with that, with your background. But I also, um, I'm very sorry to hear this because that looked like a beautiful space and a, a wonderful materiality that you were um, building up to. Yes. Buck about with. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, I mean, the other thing that that residency came with, and I'll just show you an image here of the studio, the film studios, and to have film studios available to you, um, you know, just kind of incredible. So this is kind of a couple of shots of um, working in the film studio literally before lockdown. Um, and then the music, the university also had a museum, which I filmed in, so kind of location shoots. So this is filming in Dorich House. Dora Godine um, left behind a studio museum. She was um, active in Singapore in the 1930s, one of the first women to be commissioned to make um, work for the government, um, originally from uh, Russia, um, Russian Jew, um, lived in Paris for a while, came to Singapore, worked there for about five years, making a series um, of what's called racial heads, and then came to London. And this is the studio house that she built. And I was able to film in there with the various sort of actresses here um, and here too. So you can see some of the heads in the background and we are sort of just improvising a kind of routine of how to um, put this chair together, but it's a sort of speculative meeting or a speculative group therapy meeting for these four women artists that I've been researching and making work around.
So Singapore is where I'm actually from. So a lot of my practice is also about connecting transnationally um, my current location in London to the location of Singapore, but also to, to look at those historic links in terms of colonialism. So um, Dora Gordine was one of the first women who was commissioned in the Singapore context by the British government to create public artworks. And she made a series of what are now called Asian heads, um, racial heads. And um, in her house, she has a house in West London near the university called Dorich House, where um, they have a lot of her work. And so I have kind of brought in this shot here, I've brought all the heads that she's made that are located in the house that are called Asian together. Um, and so in a, in a way, there's a kind of um, way the work is also working, which is to kind of look at museum practices um, uh, of also naming practices because actually this artist wasn't I don't think she actually called these Asian heads um, but what's interesting in in the references to these um, particular heads they don't have names um, whereas her Caucasian heads all have names they're specific people and these aren't um, so this is sort of another tangent, I suppose, or not a tangent, it's a very big part of my work, which is often working with collections. And that that's an interesting thing perhaps to think about too, because the idea of digital, I'm very interested in repatriation projects, um, and the whole idea of digital repatriation that sort of was de developed by museums is very, very interesting, um, because I've often thought, um, I actually studied anthropology and for me, there's this connection in anthropology between the local informant and then the museum idea of the source community and then often the artist, the way in which the artist is put into a role of kind of a representative of their so-called community. Um, and so digital repatriation has always been for me another way of harvesting information because actually you never return the goods, you just make these digital copies and then solicit more information from the source communities to tell you um, about what these objects are that you've got. Um, and and that's, you know, the kind of moment now where actually the whole repatriation um, project has been gathering momentum. Um, it feels like, you know, there are many more discussions about repatriation going on now. And yet we're in this very virtual sort of situation. And the repatriation that's being talked about is real. It's not any longer just the sort of digitized um, versions. So um, I don't know, it just it suddenly occurred to me there's sort of a colliding of ideas um, that are that are interesting in, in terms of the digital um, and the physical world and museums and artists practicing. Um, that, 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 that's a really interesting um, kind of web or um, connection you're making because it it links to one of the questions I wanted to ask about the, the larger kind of shift in sociopolitical context around Black Lives Matter, Indigenous Lives Matter, and um, the protests that are happening throughout the world um, and their impact on artistic practice. And, and you've already begun to talk about that in terms of repatriation of, um, of objects. Mm. and. But I, I like the way that you're talking about it in terms of the material and the in the virtual, because we've been organizing and connecting and and doing um, a lot of in, incredibly important work around um, decolonizing museums and um, challenging power structures in this mediated environment. That mm -hmm. yes, there has been protests and, and marching on the streets, but so much of how we do everything now is through these windows and, and the screen based uh, conversation. But I just wondered if you would um, say a little bit more about your practice around um, social justice or social injustice is probably a better way of talking about these issues often um, and just keep going, I guess. <laughs> I think this is very interesting. Okay. Well, um... Yeah, I was thinking about those questions, and I suppose the key thing seems to be around um, ideas of um, repatriation, but also obviously historical revisiting um, and contesting kind of received narratives in terms of history and its um, interpretation. So that's a long thread in my work. And I think the idea about often going into archives and museums is um, probably started in, in many respects um, as a person that came from Singapore, uh, from Southeast Asia to Britain, 
looking for connections would often find these connections potentially in places like museums, but maybe more interestingly in historic houses. Um, so there's a piece of work I made quite a while ago um, around chinoiserie. Um, and, you know, you wouldn't know that in these National Trust houses in Britain that maybe they had an incredible amount of chinoiserie, but only when you get access to them, you start finding out what's there. So often the whole process um, about working with museums and collections is that um, access and that access as an artist is so particular and so special but so um, isolated from what most people are experiencing. So a lot of my work is also about how one can reappropriate um, or appropriate or cannibalize um, the colonial collection um, to remake or regurgitate it in forms that um, might insist on another way of kind of understanding it um, or to push for another way of understanding it, but also to be cognizant because I'm I'm basing myself both in Britain and in Singapore. And one of the um, when I'm making work in Singapore, what I found very interesting working with museums there is thinking about the development of museums in the region was very much a kind of colonial um, uh, you know sort of enterprise um, to harvest um, economically kind of the resources of of the area um, but the interesting thing is is that what was said in you know the late 1800s about how museums could be used to situate a, a country or a location as a hub as a center is still the same rhetoric that's used today in a sort of post-colonial, post, you know, in an independent state. Um, and they're the same reasonings. And the hierarchies of power invested in these spaces are still very much the same. And so when we think about Singapore, the context of Singapore is often that it tries to dominate Southeast Asian context. Um, and so often the question then is, so, you know, what has changed and how do you, can how can you have a post-colonial or how do you think about decolonizing the museum in the um, of Southeast Asia itself? Um, so for me that's really important to hold up as a question um, although I'm based in Britain and London and then the conversation changes when you're here. Um, in terms of conversations at the moment as artists I mean the interesting thing is we've all been told by um, the chancellor here that we should all as artists we should all look for other jobs so there's been a app made by the government where you can go through and you can tell them about you know how you're good at this or whatever and lots of artists are coming out with um the suggestion that they could be a boxer and i think that's really interesting something about needing to fight um you know on a constant basis whether it be in terms of social justice or whether it be just in terms of how one sustains oneself as a practitioner. Um, I think those that's really interesting that that comes up. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, that's probably all I'd say about that. <laughs> I don't know whether maybe the other thing is, recently I've been asked by three different institutions um, as an artist to sort of come in and help them alongside other artists be part of some kind of revisioning process. So it's not just artists that are finding themselves in a difficult position, but lots of institutions are obviously flailing around. And what's really interesting is they're reaching out to artists to help them through this moment in time. Um, and maybe just a part of me feels like, yeah, they're kind of calling us in now <laughs> when um, maybe we were ignored when we said we needed to be part of the conversation um, and now we're going to be part of the conversation. And only today when I was thinking, am I getting paid enough to do this consultancy work, actually? Um, have I just done the usual thing where I'm so grateful to be asked to be part of something that I've accepted, you know, a few dollars a few pence to do something that's actually going to take a lot of work um, to reimagine something. And perhaps just on that thing about reimagining, because I know we were going to talk about teaching as well, I was thinking how difficult it is at the moment teaching, because a lot of the time we spend um, in my department, which is fine art, um, and it's in a pathway called 4D, we spend a lot of time trying to get students engaging with the materiality of making. 
um, because we're working a lot with time-based media um, and events and moving image and it's very easy to, with these materials sometimes um, to sit back and sort of dream and imagine and then when you do it oh my god you know it becomes messy and difficult um, and the whole thing kind of comes down in your head and so actually it's a fantastic moment to do a lot of dreaming and thinking and speculating but we really really gonna struggle I think in the making side of things because a lot of this making is collaborative um, and a lot of that collaboration now has to go online um, and so I I don't know where we are I feel like there's going to be quite a struggle um, and I know where I haven't I have very little to offer at the moment it feels like um, as somebody who's also trying to understand how my practice will shape up in this moment in time um, hearing about people say you know how you have to be um, the only the only the ones who can adapt can survive and thinking how do I adapt how do I adapt um, and thinking even about this context of the Toronto the the art fair that this is going into and how um, the freeze art fair is opened here and I've seen various um, commercial galleries sharing their um, you know their booth online and it's just so conventional the way in which this media is being used um, so you go to a html kind of gallery site where things are you know hung on walls virtual works are hung on walls um, i haven't yet found much moving image material um, because i don't think actually it works very well in this sort of uh you know kind of gallery virtual gallery um, so we're in complicated times, I think, and maybe like with all teaching, it's about recognizing what we don't know and how perhaps we might um, kind of collectively try and figure these things out, um, which isn't always very uh, reassuring for your students. So this is a project called um, Microcosmic Orbit, and it was an invitation um, from Noel Dillion, who is there in the background, to for me to um, enter into his studio remotely. His studio over lockdown has um, become his attic and he's an avid collector of all sorts of material. So he was kind of introducing me to the various objects he has in his space. Um, and then consequently, I was looking for things in my own space that resembled or reflected or sort of mirrored um, uh, the objects that he had. Somewhat similar, but um, often different. We're both from Southeast Asia um, and there are many sort of um, continuities of uh, kind of vernacular forms, but they're all different as well. Um, and so I was in the kind of idea of mirroring. I was also trying to work with um, Zoom or Teams backdrop to find a way of um, kind of creating a scenario where I could actually join him in his space. So I'll just um, show you if I can another image in his space. Um, we did a performance, a live performance, and so this is one of the images here too. So that's actually his attic space, and here is um, a kind of moment where there's a two-screen moment. He's performing in the background, and then I'm entering, kind of ghostly entering into his space just as I am now, so kind of enjoying this whole thing with the screen. I realized partway through our, our dialogue that uh, the technology we're working with isn't great because you've you've got this beautiful um, kind of HD aspect um, background that you're working with and, and showing. When this comes out as a video, they will put us both in squares. We will be <laughs> two two equal boxes. And my it is not a log cabin. My bunky background, Canadiana, will just be static as you're doing this wonderful um, uh, movement through virtual and actual spaces. And so it, it, it dawned on me that even even the virtuality we've lost control of in, in many ways. So, mm -hmm. but Erica, this, this is so much, um, so much to think about. And, and um, I really appreciate the way that you're sharing um, with me, but also with students, with other people, the, the struggles, the, the thinking um, that you have had forced on you <laughs> with this kind of political moment with the um, health crisis. And I think that there are some really wonderful um, strands that you've shared today. And so I, I like um, I like the energy that this um, conveys and I hope it will come across in the two boxes 
Um, <laughs> but I expect that it will. But I, I so much appreciate um, what you what you've shared today, but also really the way that you're sharing it and the way that you're um, talking about your work. I wonder if there's anything else that you wanted to say or anything that I should have asked you that I, that I didn't. Well, no, not really. I think I will just perhaps end with this image here, which is um, during the lockdown, I um, put together a proposal for the in Venice. I was invited to be one of the artists who put proposals forward. And I suppose what's interesting again as an artist is that often you spend a lot of time or the kind of artist I am you can spend a lot of time working on proposals so this was a very long proposal which took the current project Barang Barang into the Singapore pavilion um, with this idea of speculative meetings um, and the artist because the artist I were working with was my mother Fei Tan myself Erica Tan Kim Lim who was based in London but came from Singapore Georgette Chan from Shanghai that became a Singapore pioneer artist and Dora Godin who left Russia went to Singapore and then came to London um, and in a way it felt so fitting to make the pavilion platform the Venice pavilion pa platform of the nation into something that we could talk about extra kind of national kind of connections we could think about radical feminist histories or ancestries um, and now that well it wasn't successful so put a lot of effort there but what it did show me is that you can you can work with curators you can do a lot of this work remotely it's fantastic um but now that it hasn't been selected well maybe there's an opportunity to do it virtually um i'm left with that idea of perhaps thinking it through um the other thing perhaps to say is that so we can work with curators in setting things up and I'm doing that at the moment for some older work to go to the Times Museum in Guangdong um, for a December show and it's all virtual the curators are based in Korea the site is in Guangzhou in China I'm here um, but then I'm scratching my head about how the physicality of it will be how will we actually get that work up when it's just a series of instructions that have to be translated language wise through um, English, Korean, Chinese. Um, and the interesting thing, you know, in, in any install, there are issues when you're not there to problem solve it. Um, and maybe your language hasn't quite communicated what you wanted, you know. Um, I suppose the failure, the failure and the delights maybe of of, of language um, that we're really left with now to really try and have to use a, a lot more in terms of communicating what we need and what we want. Um, so, but I'll end there and it's been nice meeting you. Wonderful, Erica. And uh, I look forward to seeing this work actually, virtually, or whatever the future, whatever we call these things in the future. I okay. think the blending of both uh, is is happening as we speak. Um, so, I'll uh, cut it off there, but thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> it's very difficult to end, isn't it? It's like, are you going to say cut point or, you know? <laughs>